Happy Constitution Day! I'm Mark Karras from the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Our three-time Telly Award-winning series Constitution Hall Pass is turning five years old this year. So we decided to celebrate by bringing together some of our favorite moments from the show's history. In this Greatest Hits episode, we'll visit the Constitution Center, but we'll also be leaving the Philadelphia city limits. We'll see New York City, Washington, D.C., and President James Madison's home in Virginia, just to name a few places. You'll learn about the Articles of Confederation, the structure of the federal government under the Constitution, the duties of the President and of Congress, and the ways that you can use your voice to make a difference. It's a great way to celebrate Constitution Day, and for us, it's a fun way to look back at the show that we love making, and that we've been bringing you for five years. Thanks for watching Constitution Hall Pass. We'll be bringing you new episodes soon with even more constitutional topics, so stay tuned for more information about the new episodes. Thanks for watching and have a great Constitution Day. Happy Constitution Day! I'm Saya Hermosi here on the front lawn of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. For those of us here at the center, today is the biggest day of the year. We're celebrating the Constitution's birthday. September 17, 1787 was the day on which the Constitution was signed. In the Articles of Confederation, which came before the Constitution, each state got to have one vote in national affairs. This sounds like a great idea. That way, every state got an equal say, and the big states didn't get to determine everything. However, when you think about it, that meant that the people who lived in those smaller states had a lot more power than the big state people, because the votes of a few people living in small states could overrule those many people who lived in a big state. So how could they figure it out? As it turns out, they weren't really sure how to figure it out. The delegates from Virginia, which was a big state back then, wanted to have it set up so the more people lived in a state, the more representatives they would have. Delegates from New Jersey, which was a small state, wanted to keep it so that each state had equal votes, and they couldn't really find any middle ground. Fortunately, Roger Sherman over here was able to help them come up with a compromise that structured the way Congress looks today. He decided to arrange it so that there would be two houses of Congress. In the House of Representatives, representation is based on how many people live in each state. So the more people live in a state, the more representatives they get. In the Senate, each state, no matter how big or how small, only gets two senators. That way, both sides got to have their way, and they made the compromise even better by giving the two houses different jobs. For example, it's up to the Senate to approve treaties and people the President picks for certain positions but it's up to the House of Representatives to come up with bills talking about the government's money. I'm standing next to Alexander Hamilton. You probably recognize him from your $10 bills. Hamilton had a lot to do with getting this entire convention together in the first place. See, under the Articles of Confederation, the states were really only loosely tied together, which led to a lot of problems. States were doing things like printing their own money, signing their own trade agreements with other countries, and getting into boundary disputes and arguments over fishing rights. One of the places in particular that was causing problems regarding fishing rights was the Potomac River, which separates Maryland from Virginia. Those two states just couldn't agree on who was allowed to fish and sail where. They tried to have a convention in 1786 in Annapolis, Maryland to try to figure this out, but nobody showed up to it. Hamilton, however, realized that the United States was going to have to answer these questions if it was going to survive, so he started bugging everybody to get another convention together in Philadelphia the next year. So if it weren't for Hamilton, this convention may never have happened in the first place. Now once the convention started, Hamilton wasn't listened to as much. See, he was really kind of arrogant, very full of himself. Not everybody liked that about him. And one of those people, Aaron Burr, would later end Hamilton's life in a duel in Weehawken, New Jersey. Still though, if it wasn't for his telling everybody how they needed to fix the problems between the states, this convention might never have happened. Now, federalism isn't the only way that we've divided power here in the United States. We also have the system of checks and balances. This refers to the way that power is divided between the three branches of the federal government here in Washington. We've got three branches of the federal government. The legislative, Congress, whose job is to make laws. The executive, the president and his advisors, who make sure that the laws are being followed. And the judiciary, the Supreme Court, who determines the meaning of the law and of the Constitution. They realized that if power was separated into the different branches, then no one person or group could end up with too much power and start pushing everyday citizens around. Think about the example of the presidential veto. The president can refuse to approve a law that's passed by Congress if he or she thinks that it's a bad law for the country. 
When that happens, the only way that law can go into effect is if Congress changes the way it's written to make it work better, or if two-thirds of both the House and the Senate decide to approve it anyway. So if Congress tries to pass a law that's going to be unfair, the President can stop it from going into effect by not signing it. Or if the President is holding up Congress's work just to be difficult, the Congress can override his or her veto for the good of the country. And ultimately, it benefits all of us in the end. They wanted to be bound together for reasons like defense, but they also wanted to keep their own independent and unique characteristics because there were some pretty big differences between each state. Their first solution was the Articles of Confederation. Drafted during the war and ratified by the states in 1781, the Articles of Confederation laid out how the government was supposed to operate. It gave a few very specific powers to the central government and left most of the responsibility to the states. It did specifically guarantee that the states would be bound together forever in a perpetual union where all the states would be treated equally. The Articles of Confederation gave the central government the power to make war, to negotiate diplomatic agreements with other nations, and to resolve border issues with new western territories. This central government, which was called the Congress of the Confederation, consisted only of a legislative branch. There was no federal judiciary and no executive department. Each state got one vote, so all of its representatives had to be agreement on each issue. And in order to change the articles, the states all had to agree unanimously, making it very hard to change the way the system was set up. Adding another difficulty, the Articles of Confederation didn't give the central government the power to raise an army or collect taxes. They had to rely on the state governments to contribute troops or money when necessary. It didn't take the delegates long to realize they would have to come up with something entirely new. So they took James Madison's lead and began drafting an entirely new document that would give shape to the young republic. But writing the Constitution wasn't easy. These delegates disagreed on everything you could disagree about, from taxation to state representation to how to pick a president and, of course, slavery. The last one was such a hot-button issue that the delegates left the word slavery out of the document entirely. Slavery would be a matter for the states to decide. All of us know that decision would haunt the future and Americans would end up fighting a terrible war to resolve the issue. But that's a story for another time. Most of the compromises the delegates worked out about these issues appear in Articles 1, 2, and 3, the parts of the Constitution that lay out the structure of the federal government. As for the rest of the Constitution and how the document won the approval of the country, I'm going to enlist the help of a friend of mine here in Signers Hall. Allow me to introduce you to Governor Morris, one of the delegates from Pennsylvania. I love talking about Governor Morris for a couple of reasons, not least of which is his peg leg. Morris lost his left leg in a carriage accident here in Philadelphia and wore a wooden prosthesis for the rest of his life. But in addition to his disability, which didn't slow him down much, Governor is also interesting for the key role he played at the convention. He gave more speeches than any other delegate. He also served on the Committee of Style, which actually wrote the words of the Constitution, including the famous and powerful opening phrase, We the People. But the Constitution was just words on parchment until something else very important happened. You see, the Constitution didn't just become the supreme law of the land the moment it was signed by the delegates on September 17, 1787. First, it had to be ratified or approved by nine of the states. And although the Constitutional Convention met in secret, the delegates had placed the final authority in the new government in the hands of the people, in an idea called popular sovereignty. That meant the document had to be reviewed and approved by the people themselves. To do that, the delegates included Article 7 to define the way in which the Constitution would be approved. Here's what it says. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution. When you look at the path the presidency has taken, that really looks like an experiment. Think of it like a swinging pendulum. For a while, our leadership kept swinging between either having too much or not enough executive authority. It took us a while, and almost an uprising, to strike a balance between the two. You might say that we as Americans have always had issues with authority, especially when it's been lopsided and not very fair. To really understand how and why the Founding Fathers shaped the presidency the way they did in the Constitution, we've got to look back, way back, even to before we were Americans. The big problems really began after the French and Indian War. We're talking 1754 to 1763. You would have thought it was a good time to be a part of the British Empire. Britain had just defeated the French, using both colonial militia and regular British soldiers, and had been given a whole lot of new land as a result of the peace treaty. But all that fighting had cost the British a lot of money. 
So the British government figured that it would be fair to ask the colonists, us, to pay some more taxes, since the war had been waged to protect our homes. Here's the problem, no one really asked us. The British just told us it was happening. And of course, we, the colonists, did not think that was so fair. We even came up with an expression for it. I bet you can guess it, it has a very classic ring. No taxation without representation! We believed that we should only be taxed by people we had voted for, like the colonial assemblies. Now, taxes were being placed on us from Britain. And then, to make it even worse, they were being enforced by governors, the colony's executives, who had been hand-picked by the British government with no input from the colonial assemblies. This really seemed pretty unfair. It took a revolution to solve our problem with too much authority, and when we got our turn to write our own rules, we may have pushed that pendulum a little too far in the other direction. Welcome to Montpelier, James Madison's country estate in beautiful Virginia. President Madison is known as the father of the Constitution for all of the contributions he made to its writing and ratification. And some of his best ideas came while he was thinking right here at his home. So let's look at those ideas and see how Madison helped slow that pendulum down. The year was 1787. Our country was struggling with the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. To fix things, they called a convention to be held in Philadelphia. Madison, who was on the invite list, could see firsthand how tough it was for the government to get anything done without a strong executive. As a member of the Confederation Congress, he knew this weakened the young country. So before he even left for Philadelphia, Madison did his homework here at Montpelier. He spent time brainstorming ideas for a new system of government. It was here that Madison came up with the bulk of what became known as the Virginia Plan, which would be introduced at the convention for Madison by Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph. The Virginia Plan included many of the ideas that eventually went into the convention's finished product. It included a national executive, to be chosen by the popularly elected national legislature. The executive's job would be to enforce the laws of the land and to unite the states under a single administrative voice. There were a few things that Madison wasn't sure about. For example, would the new executive be just one person or a group of individuals? Over here is James Wilson who, despite his glasses, had a clear vision about giving the executive power to just one person. Like James Madison, Wilson had served in the Confederation Congress and had a pretty good idea of what could happen without a strong executive. On June 1st, he made his pitch for a president, one person to represent the executive authority for the entire country. Wilson thought that the United States was such a big country, it needed one strong leader to represent all those different and distant places. He pointed out that all the other elected offices were at the local or the state level, which meant that there was no one position that was voted on by all the states. But if there were a president who was chosen by all the people, then he, or maybe someday she, would be able to represent the entire country. Wilson had another idea about how to elect the president, which didn't end up in the Constitution. He wanted the president to be elected by the people directly. So what's that method called? Is it the presidential lottery, the electoral college, or the caucus of the states? If you said electoral college, you got it right. In the electoral college, each state gets a certain number of votes based on how many senators and representatives they have in Congress. The states choose electors to cast those votes, and whichever candidate gets the most electoral votes wins. They decided on the name of president for the chief executive. They called for the president to give to the Congress information on the State of the Union. Nowadays, the president does this once a year in a nationally broadcast address. They gave the president the responsibility of appointing the heads of the executive departments. This allowed the president to form the advisory group called the cabinet. And they gave the president the power of veto over any bill passed by Congress. Although, Congress can overrule that veto with a two-thirds vote in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. After the Constitution was signed on September 17, 1787, it was pretty obvious who the first president was going to be. George Washington was the only person in the country who was loved enough and trusted enough to be the chief executive. Today we're going to explore one of the three branches of government, 
I'll give you a few clues and let's see if you can guess which branch will be today's topic. It's the first branch to be described in the Constitution. The Founding Fathers wrote more about it in the Constitution than any other part of the government, and its primary job is to make laws. So, is it the executive branch, the legislative branch, or the judicial branch? If you answer the legislative branch, you're right. The legislative branch, also known as Congress, is outlined in the first article to be written after those famous opening words of the Constitution, we the people. Let's start with some basic facts on Congress. It's made up of two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The primary function of these two houses, working together, is to make laws. That job is spelled out by the Founding Fathers in Article I of the Constitution. Congress has a lot to do. Here's a list of jobs. Which ones are Congress responsible for doing? By now you probably figured it out. It's all of the above and more. It's a big job that Congress has, and the biggest out of all of them is the final one, to make all laws. So how was a law made? What's the process spelled out in Article I? In Article I, it's explained that laws are made when a member of one of the two houses of Congress introduces a bill for consideration. The bill is discussed in a subcommittee, then a regular committee, then by the entire House. The same process has to take place in the other house. When both houses come to a majority agreement on what the bill should look like after debate and compromise, that bill is then presented to the president. As long as the president approves what they've given him, the bill then becomes a law. Seems like a straightforward enough process. But as we'll see, there's a lot more to it than just that. To begin, we've come here, to where it all started. This might be the most important room in our country's history. Right here in the Assembly Room at Independence Hall, the Continental Congress signed the Declaration of Independence. And 11 years later, here in the exact same room, the Constitutional Convention created the supreme law of the land, the Constitution of the United States. Now, the Articles of Confederation, our governing document before the Constitution, created a weak central government that couldn't do things like raise an army, levy taxes, or mint coins. Before we won our independence in the Revolutionary War, the British had insisted on controlling practically every little thing that we did in the colonies. And we didn't think that was fair, because we weren't allowed to elect members of parliament to make laws for the British Empire. When it comes to our independence and our system of government, this room is literally the birthplace of the United States. Just imagine what it would have been like to be sitting here listening in on the debates over the future of our nation. James Madison came from the upper class of Virginia society. He was a really smart guy a guy who had served in the government at a few different levels and read about systems of government all around the world. He was committed to finding a way to balance the needs of the government with the rights of the people. Just listen to how he described signing the compromise. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, no controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men. The great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Madison thought he had worked out a way to make sure that the government could effectively run the country while still not growing so big that it would oppress the citizens. Here in New York City, the mayor proposed banning restaurants, movie theaters, sports stadiums, and food carts from selling any sugary drink above 16 fluid ounces in size. Let's start by looking at the two sides of the issue, here at Federal Hall, which was once Congress's home. Preserving people's health is a noble goal, and not just for keeping individuals healthy. Higher rates of disease caused by poor diets mean that everyone, not just those who get sick, have to pay more money for health insurance premiums. 
They also mean that the government has to spend more of its money on programs like Medicare and Medicaid. On the other hand, drinking soda is a personal choice. And it could be a very slippery slope when the government gets involved in regulating those kinds of choices. Laws restricting soda sales can also have a damaging effect on businesses that serve the drinks, as they might have to spend a lot of money conforming to new standards, or else lose customers as people stop buying their products. So how's it all going to work out? On one side, you'll have public health experts who will support a law on sugary drinks to keep people healthy. They'll be allied with the companies that provide health care and medical insurance, who are trying to keep costs down to keep their customers happy, exercising their economic freedom in the process. And joining them will be the parents and other citizens who are worried about the health impact of soda. On the other side, the companies that make the sugary drinks will be strongly opposed to the law. It limits their economic freedom by hampering their ability to sell their products. Restaurant owners and beverage suppliers will also fight the law, since their industries will be affected. And private citizens who feel like the bill limits their individual right to make their own choices will also resist the law's passing. And in the middle will be the media, TV, newspapers, the internet, and all other sources of information. They'll be shaping the way that we, the people, see the issue and they can have a lot of influence on how the debate plays out. People on both sides of the issue can also use the media to get their viewpoint across, adding to the voices being heard in the debate. So remember, you have a role to play in the way our government works. What's your take on soda laws? What other kinds of issues affect you, your family, and your classmates in your community? And how can you make sure that your voice is heard in the halls of power? It's up to you to stay informed and think about the things that affect you. And when an issue comes up that moves you to action, don't just sit there, do something about it. Contact your elected officials, start discussions at home and in the classroom, or post your thoughts on Facebook or Twitter. When you use your rights as a citizen, you're helping to shape the country you live in and helping us all live up to the ideal of a more perfect union. I hope you enjoy learning about the legislative branch on this episode of Constitution Hall Pass. From the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, I'm Danielle Lene. See you next time on Constitution Hall Pass.